I'm especially pleased that you all invited me. So it's, a, it's an honor if you think that students have selected your work and want to hear what you have to say. So I'm, I'm grateful to you uh, for the invitation. I've also been thinking about the passage of time. I was here once before about 10 years ago. I was in Tom Hahn's guest at that time, and Andy C. I just saw Andy. Uh, and my husband was still alive at that time, and Peter Marler was still alive at that time, and we were at Marty Morton, then Maria Perea's house. And in the meantime, we've lost three of those uh, four people. And so time does pass along. But another way about time passing along is that you all will be giving these talks in just no time. So it's especially pleasing, again, to have your invitation and have your support. And then I'll look forward to coming to talks of yours uh, before too long, I, I hope. Can you hear me? Not real well. Not real well? OK. Am I, am I uh, mic'd, or am I just talking to the? OK, so I simply, and there is no mic. I just need to speak more loudly. Okay. Sure, I'll do my best. And stop me, seriously, if I don't, because I, I tend to have a kind of a low voice. And uh, I don't, I'm here to hope that you'll hear me. So I, I would rather that you told me uh, than you didn't. OK, so I want to credit people whose ideas and methods and data I'll be telling you about today. So in this figure, um, and the interesting how the projector alters some of the uh, colors that I associate with these people. But in any case, <laughs> Jonathan Atwell is a key contributor to the work that I'm going to describe to you. Jonathan is a former uh, postdoc, former graduate student, former postdoc, now research scientist. Adam Fudiker is a current postdoc who did much of the work that I want to describe today. Tim Greaves, this is getting kind of familial, as you'll see. Tim was an undergraduate in the lab, the same way Beth was, and uh, is now a, uh, an assistant professor at North Dakota State University. Mark Peterson, I'll tell you a bit of some genomics data. And Mark is an assistant former graduate student uh, assistant professor at Viterbo University. And Borja Mia. So Bora is uh, an evolutionary biologist uh, who's a Spaniard and did his training at uh, UCLA. So these folks are collaborators, uh, former students, uh, idea generators, and, and method providers. And I'm uh, appreciative to all of them. And I was thinking about it, too. You show these pictures because you want to do credit. And you also show these pictures because it's like your support team. You know? So you're out in front of a group, and you might find that a little challenging. But you know, you've got your team behind you. And so it's like showing pictures of your whoops. Not your pets in the sense that they're your pets. Pets in the sense that they make you feel good. But. <laughs> OK. So the research program that I'm involved with has a number of goals. And basically, it's to contribute to the ongoing synthesis of integrative and evolutionary biology. And the disciplines that give rise to that effort to synthesize then are evolutionary endocrinology and seasonality and geographic variation population divergence. And we're pursuing this research program through long and intensive study of a single species. And the species is the dark-eyed junco. It's a songbird. So done in terms of Venn diagrams, we're combining evolutionary endocrinology, seasonality, and geographic variation. And we're putting the junco in the middle as our study system to uh, unite these various approaches. So what about evolutionary endocrinology? What is it, and what are we trying to find out in that regard? And to me, evolutionary endocrinology is seeking relationships between hormones and phenotypes and fitness. And a key concept in that effort to relate hormones to phenotype to fitness is hormonal pleiotropy. And in analogous to, analogous to genetic pleiotropy, it's a way of describing the fact that a single signaling molecule like a hormone can have multiple effects on the phenotype to the extent that this signaling molecule is being introduced into the organism via the circulation and it's interacting with receptors on various tissues throughout the organism, giving rise to different traits that are being co-expressed in a coordinated way owing to the signaling molecule, that's pleiotropy. Okay? Multiple effects traceable to variation in a single factor. And hormonal pleiotropy plays a role in evolutionary endocrinology because of its association with adaptation and constraint. So this is sort of a mantra for me, but um, if you'll bear with me, if we view a hormone momentarily like a dial, 
and we imagine the relationship between hormone phenotype and multiple traits in the phenotype uh, that have fitness consequences, and we change the environment. Then a change in the environment might induce a change in the hormone levels, which might lead to a coordinated change in a whole series of traits. If those coordinated changes in traits are advantageous in the new environment, you have, in a sense, instant adaptation. Okay, you don't have to wait for recombination. You've got a signaling molecule that leads to the co-expression of a series of traits at new trait values. On the other hand, when you view a hormone as a dial and you change the environment, if only a subset of the traits that are mediated by that hormone are advantageous in the new environment, and some of them are disadvantageous, then the hormonal pleiotropy can act at least as a temporary constraint. And that tension or balance between adaptation and constraint and the role of hormones in the middle is motivating uh, our work, has been for a while, uh, and continues to. So if you're going to pursue, then, evolutionary endocrinology, you need information on how individuals and populations vary in hormones and in their traits. You need to know what evolves. Is it that hormone signal that I just speculated about? Or might it be the sensitivity of different tissues to that circulating signaling molecule? So that if a tissue that is related to a trait ceases to express receptors and can unplug itself, in a sense, from a circulating hormone, then that sensitivity or differential sensitivity of the tissue can pr allow uh, evolution to proceed and proceed on a more trait-by-trait -trait basis as opposed to the organism as a whole. So we need to know where does the variation lie in the signal or in the sensitivity or both, and I'll return to that. And then those hormones and those signaling molecules that are interacting with receptors on tissues are obviously leading to changes in the cell biology. And if you're thinking about steroid hormones, as we have in our program, then those steroid hormones, one of the many things they do is uh, alter gene expression. So if we want to relate hormone to phenotype, it's going to be via changes in gene expression and then associate that uh, with, with fitness. OK, second discipline that we're interested in trying to bring together is seasonality. And we all know that um, seasonal environments select for accurate timing. So for this tree, there's a time for leaves, and there's a time for uh, what look like dead branches, and the leaves will come again. If it's a bird, then Tunis Piersma describes phenotypic flexibility on a seasonal basis in some contrast to phenotypic plasticity, so that a bird will go through different uh, stages in its annual cycle where its phenotype varies greatly uh, from time to time. If selection acts on mechanisms, which it clearly does if we're going to combine seasonality and evolutionary endocrinology, then we need to know where the variation lies. So for the hormonal pleiotropy, I showed you a John Wingfield figure for all the things that testosterone can affect. And now I'm going to show you another John Wingfield figure of a heuristic way of approaching uh, how selection might act on mechanisms. All the different steps between the external environment and the phenotype expression, which might influence fitness. Organisms have to perceive the environment. They have to transduce changes in day length, changes in temperature, changes in food availability, changes in social situations into internal physiology, creating an internal environment to reflect the external environment. And then that internal environment has to lead to responses in different tissues. So you can see these themes of uh, independence and integrated level. Uh, mechanisms aren't simple. So this is another John figure. And if we want to know where the variation lies, we're going to need to look at secretion. We're going to need to look at variation in the brain, variation in signaling to the pituitary, to uh, endocrine tissue like a gonad, to how that hormone or signaling molecule is transported in the body, and as I've been referring to, how it interacts with uh, target tissues. So lots of places to look for variation. We're going to undergo the uh, work with the assumption that that variation is the raw material on which selection can act. OK, and then the Junko system and geographic variation. So this is the bird that we study. And Junkos are very variable geographically. So they have a long taxonomic complex history. Some people would look at this and say there are 15 species. Some people would look at this and say there's three or, more recently, four species. Uh, but the point is, not only do they look different from place to place, but they're also very different in their timing. So some of them are migrants, some of them are not. Some of them reproduce early, some of them reproduce late. So they differ in the way they look, and they differ in where they live, 
and they differ in how they time uh, their, their seasonal events. Now, juncos will hybridize in the north. So the southern ones are, and I'll get there to there in a second, they're more diverged. But in the north, while they look quite different from, same to, from place to place, there is uh, hybridization going on uh, in ranges that, oh, sorry, um, up in north where we've got two different subspecies coming into contact and there'll be gene flow across those. Uh, that seems to be stable in time, excuse me, and then a little bit there in the uh, southwest or west where, again, there are small isolated populations that are comprised of, of hybrids. Now, Borja Mila, the evolutionary biologist from Spain, has done some beautiful work with his students, and this is a phylogeny using mitochondrial DNA. And what you can see here, I hope, is that we've got uh, structuring, population structuring that's detectable with the mitochondrial DNA in these what I would call more southern species. So down in Costa Rica, Guatemala, the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula, uh, Guadalupe Island, those are distinguishable from one another at the level of mitochondrial DNA. If you look up here for the quote, northern juncos, a little bit few yellow eyes than the ones that are found throughout North America. It's a big polytomy here. So using mitochondrial DNA, you can't really uh, I recognize much in the way of genetic structure. However, um, with using the very newest techniques, and again, this is Borja Mila, so he's doing genotype by sequencing, using SNPs, nuclear SNPs, to look for structure in the populations that are in, in the north for the junco. And when you do do this, the colors are not that standy outy, uh, but what uh, is being depicted here is the fact that uh, juncos in South Dakota have a slightly different genetic structure, structure from juncos in California, from juncos in the, in the far north. So they have diverged sufficiently to see population structure if you go to the very latest techniques with, when you're looking at vast uh, bioinformatic uh, levels of, of data. Okay, so that's a lot of introduction about disciplines. Uh, what's the question? So today I'd like to present some data to you about our current question. And that is, how do uh, evolutionary endocrinology, seasonality, and geographic variation come together to help explain the population divergence in the junco that I've just shown you the photos of? And in particular, what are the roles of seasonal timing and assortative mate choice in accounting for divergence? Are they both important? Is one important? Is another more important than another? the other? And what are the roles of adaptive plasticity versus fixed genetic differences in accounting for divergence? So these are the questions that we're addressing. Introduce another concept, and that is allochrony, heteropatry, and divergence. So this is terms that apply to how differences in timing can influence or give rise to divergence among populations. Allochrony, as you know from your evolution classes, will have been a, a way of describing uh, differences in timing of reproduction that affect who's mating with whom. Heteropatry is not as widely used a term, but when I read about it, I went, oh my gosh, you know, this is so interesting. This is this is our bird, okay? Heteropatry was introduced by a man named Kevin Winker. Well, actually, you can go farther back, Dan Bolnick and others, but in terms of the bird world, heteropatry refers to seasonal differences in geographic distribution. So populations that are sympatric at one time of the year and allopatric at another time of the year are heteropatric in their distribution, okay? Sympatric part of the time, allopatric other parts of the time. And both of these, whether it's differences in timing at a particular site or differences in distribution that play out over the course of the year, they can provide behavioral barriers to gene flow in contrast to our traditional ecological barrier to gene flow or mountain or Gulf of Mexico or whatever. Uh, there's opportunities for gene flow, but it, these differences in timing and uh, timing-related distributions can affect the degree of gene flow. So the examples then in this area are maggot flies, which are uh, uh, apple flies uh, related to sympatric speciation, flowering plants that may flower at different times so the pollinators aren't transferring pollen from one population to another, periodical cicadas where broods are coming out 13 years or 17 years so there's very little opportunity to be breeding at the same time. These are classic examples, allochrony. Migratory birds are a great example of heteropatry 
and we think that this particularly uh, applies to, to the Junko system. So these are juncos in the north, and there are six different types, call them subspecies if you like, call them races, call them whatever. I've told you the biology of the degree of genetic divergence and who mates with whom. These birds are uh, allopatric during breeding. So the photos are the drawings of the birds, and the different colors on the map refer to the breeding distributions of these different types. Uh, I want to point out two. You'll be seeing these again, the slate-colored junco and a resident form of the slate-colored junco, the Carolina junco. So these are eastern birds that live in, uh, in the Appalachians. And then there are Oregon juncos that live here on the, on the west coast. And you'll be seeing them again too. But with respect to heteropatry, I think the best thing to do is show you a, show you a slide. This is definitely one of those, one picture worth a thousand words about what the distributions might imply about opportunities for gene flow. Hmm. I'm dead. There's probably a button on the presenter that has a black screen. Um, you want to come help me? Uh, be, uh, Bless you. So I did that to myself. I pushed that button and did that? Uh, right below the okay. next slide button. So <laughs> I'll try not to do that again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is the photograph <laughs> by Peter Pereira. And it was taken in Colorado, and it was taken in the winter, you can tell, because the snow was on the ground. It was a little bit to the east of the front range. And the point is, there are a number of different subspecies of juncos in this photograph. Same time, same date, same food, same place. You'll hear that little mantra again. And in this photo, then, is a gray-headed junco that breeds around there in Colorado. There's a slate-colored junco that will be heading up to the boreal forest in just a month or so from this time. There's an Oregon junco that will be heading north and west uh, along the western coast of the United States. And there's a pink-sided junco. That pink-sided junco will be headed to Wyoming, where other pink-sided juncos can be found. But the point is, in the winter, here they all are together. In the breeding season, they're in different places. So they're heteropatric in their distribution, and the timing of events of the annual cycle vary among these groups depending upon when it becomes favorable uh, to head north. So Winker went further than just describing heteropatry as a form of a distribution. He said heteropatry, he thought, was an undervalued or underestimated uh, factor in explaining the degree of speciation that we see in avian lineages, that really we may have been missing the boat with our uh, over, perhaps overemphasis on, uh, on allopatry as the origin of new species. I'm not a speciation biologist, so I'm not here to tell you that there are six species or there are not six species. I'm here to be interested in the interaction between timing and population divergence in relation to the potential uh, for speciation or population divergence, at least. So Winker says, if I'm right about this, that this form of a distribution may affect which birds give rise to new species and which don't, then uh, he would predict that if you look in different lineages, you would find that lineages that contain migratory forms uh, would be more speciose, say, than lineages that did not form migratory forms. I'm not going to try to test that prediction. He says if this is the case, then despite the opportunity for gene flow during the time of year when the birds are sympatric, nevertheless we ought to see reduced gene flow between migratory and resident forms despite their coexistence in winter if, in fact, the timing difference between them uh, affects the degree to which divergence occurs. He says, I think maybe disruptive selection leads to divergence, and you could look for disruptive selection. So let me elaborate on that a little bit. His view of how this might come about, whether we're talking about seasonal variation or whether we're talking about the glaciers receding, is that uh, there's a seasonal resource pulse to the north that is seasonal in nature, so there's food available, in the summer, and that food is no longer available when winter comes. And so birds will arrive to take advantage of that resource pulse, but they will draw uh, when the resource pulse is uh, passing into winter. 
and that migratory populations then are in a position to take advantage of that resource pulse. If that's the case, then he predicts there should be reduced fitness between migrants and residents in those instances where they do hybridize. He says, look, if you're a hybrid between a resident and a migratory form, but you choose elect, didn't for some reason migrate in a particular year, then you might breed too late, and that that's a disadvantageous situation. Or if you're a hybrid between a migrant and a resident and you do migrate, but you get there too soon, then you lay your eggs in the snow falls and uh, you have reduced fitness. This is the kind of speculation he does. We don't have any data on this. I'm interested in the mechanisms of timing, and that's what I would like to tell you about. But I'm trying to set up the framework for why I think the timing differences are interesting. Okay. Winker also says that it should go both ways. So that if migratory populations are uh, evolving from resident populations owing to resource pulses in one time of year in another place, then if the resource resource pulse situation changes, then there's no reason why migrants shouldn't give rise to residents. So, so if a, an increase in opportunities for breeding might select against migration, just as it might have given rise to migration under other circumstances. And finally, he says people need to look at this. They need to look at mechanisms. And my ears pricked up at this point. He says, I'm predicting that in the early stages, the differences between migrants and residents should be more plastic in nature. And in later stages, he's predicting that the uh, phenotypic differences between migrants and residents should be more fixed genetically. Hence, looking in a common garden, you might make different predictions. OK, so here's where we step in with wanting to do some of our own work. Winker is saying that longer diverged populations might be more fixed in their behavior than more recently diverged populations. And so we decided to compare and contrast migrants and residents in a pair of populations that are longer diverged and a pair of populations that are more recently diverged. And to do this by holding them in a common garden so that they were experiencing the same environment, again, with respect to day length, food availability, and whatever, and then see if they do the same things with respect to their timing or they do different things. We're comparing slate-colored juncos in the Appalachians. Those are the top two pictures that I showed you. And then we're going to be comparing Oregon juncos from Southern California, where they have most recently diverged, like just in the last, say, 35 years. A uh, migratory population has given rise to a residence, population of residents. OK, so here are the juncos in the east. I'm showing you a range map again. I'm showing you where we work. And so we work in the Appalachians. And it's the, uh, during winter, both of these kinds of juncos are coexisting in the Appalachians. The slate-colored group, and then there's the long-distance migrants that are the ones that go to the boreal forest and ones that stay year-round uh, in the Appalachians. And you can see here what the habitat is like during winter when, when these birds, excuse me, when these birds are found together. OK, so what do we do? Well, we went to Virginia in December, and we caught some migrants and residents who are distinguishable from one another by their plumage types, body size, bill color, and the like. We brought them to Indiana, where we live and where we work, held them indoors in flocks for a little bit, and then caged them individually, giving them ad-lib food and natural day length, matching what they would have experienced in Virginia. And then we sampled their pre-breeding physiology and uh, behavior uh, during March. We sacrificed the birds at the end and collected their tissues for gene expression. So this is what the sampling regime looked like. Mind you, we're looking in that month of March where it's not quite breeding for the ones that are going to stick around, and they haven't quite left for the ones that are migrating. And they're experiencing, as it turns out, day lengths that are getting close to more or less equal. And we, did, the, we did our sampling on four successive weeks. So that's what the red splashy stars are. And it took two days to do the birds and pick them at random and um, measure things for their hormones, um, measure things about their morphology, and then later um, measure things about their gene expression in the tissues. So the green blob here is the day of the end of the experiment when we collected the birds. So the first thing we did was look at an index of migratory behavior. And the prediction is if things are more or less fixed in some way genetically, then the migrants and the residents should be different. And migrants tend to lay on pre-migratory fat, residents not so much. And so we were contrasting the migrant and resident population for how fat they were at this time of year that's circled here in blue. And what we found, the blue is the migrants, and the red is the residents, 
is that from the very start here, they differed significantly in how much fat they had. And how do you look at fat? Well, you literally blow on the bird. So you're looking on the ventral surface, and you're seeing how much fat is accumulated here in the furculum and on the abdomen. And when there's more, you get a higher score. And when there's less, then you don't see the fat uh, having accumulated beneath the skin like this. You can get lightheaded blowing on a, <laughs> a lot of birds to see what their fat scores is. So if you know about that, then we're compatriots under the skin. But. All right, then we also looked at reproductive timing, indices, indices of reproductive timing, including how much they developed a cloacal protuberance and uh, what their testosterone levels were and uh, what the size of the gonads were at the end of the experiment. So this is a cloacal protuberance, right? This is as racy as this presentation will get. And it's the cloaca that's expanded uh, after the reproductive axis has come online. And birds will store sperm in this external manifestation of their maleness. Uh, and you can measure the size of the cloacal protuberance. So we're comparing, again, the migrants and the residents, uh, migrants in blue, residents in red, and what you can see is over the course of the one month, same environment, preparing to do different things, the two populations differed from one another. So the cloacal protuberance grew in the residents and it remained small uh, in the migrants. Okay, also measuring hormones, we did this in two ways. We wanted to know what their testosterone levels were and we wanted to know what their initial levels of testosterone were and we also wanted to know how much testosterone they would put out if we gave a jab, literally, um, to the HPG axis. So if you inject a bird's chest with gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GNRH, then that will stimulate the pituitary and the gonad to release testosterone. And it's a way of seeing what the axis is capable of at a particular time, even though that might not be how it was manifesting itself when you first picked up the bird. So you grab the bird fast, you collect a blood sample, ASAP, you inject the chest with uh, GnRH, and you wait 30 minutes, and then you collect a second sample. And that'll give you both the initial level and the elevated level. And so initial testosterone in the migrants and the residents were different. Okay, so the residents, again, are in red, and their testosterone levels were higher persistently or consistently than they were in the residents, in the migrants. So residents with higher testosterone. It's not as high as it gets, uh, but it was sig meaningfully and significantly, we think, different between the residents and the migrants. Furthermore, when we injected with testosterone, with GnRH, to see how high up the testosterone would go, then the uh, residents in red had significantly higher levels than the uh, migrants in blue. When we collected the birds, their gonad mass was strikingly different. So the resident gonad was larger on average than the migrant gonad. And you can see a little picture here. I'm not sure it's bright enough, but those are kind of representative gonad sizes. Again, spring, not yet full size, same food, same temperature, same housing conditions, different response. Now, this next slide is only about five days old, and I haven't tried to say it out loud before, so let me see if I can do it right, OK? We're interested in variation, how selection might act on variation. We're interested in how variation might relate to timing. So we don't just want to know whether the residents differ from the migrants. We'd also like to know about variation within each group, particularly variation within the migrants. So we, working with Jonathan Atwell and Craig Stryker, uh, had information from feathers on stable isotopes which could give us a clue about where the birds were that were in the experiment in the winter, where they were the preceding late summer when they grew their feathers. So by looking at a hydrogen isotope ratio, heavier hydrogen ratios are found farther south. Lighter hydrogen ratios are found farther north. Fundamentally, the moisture is coming up. I think you all know about stable isotopes, but coming up from the tropics, raining out along the way, and the farther you are, uh, from the tropics, the less heavy hydrogen you have in the precipitation, and that can be reflected in tissues because you are what you eat. And so if you were eating farther north when you grew your feathers, you might expect a different isotopic ratio than if you were farther south when you were growing your feathers. Okay, so what we asked was, uh, was there a relationship between the isotope ratio in the feathers and the size of the gonad at the time we took our measurement? 
So reminding you what the distribution is and that the residents are going to stay in the Appalachians and the migrants are going to travel north. And this is the relationship we found. So we just got our stable isotope data last week. This is, uh, I fell off my chair. I thought this was really pretty interesting. It suggests that if you look at the red dots, again, you're looking at the residents and they have the isotopic ratio that reflects a lower latitude. And when you look at the migrants as a group, they have an isotopic ratio that reflects being from farther north when they were growing their feathers. And when you look at them collectively, then the degree to which the birds had grown their gonad on a particular date appeared to relate to how far they had to go. If they didn't have any very far to go at all because they were residents, their gonads were big, high on the y-axis. If they had a medium distance to go, then the gonad was a little larger, less than the residents, but bigger than the ones on the low end here. So if you look at the data collectively, it really suggests that the gonad had grown to a particular mass in reflection to how far the bird was from where its ultimate destination was, where it would be breeding. Now, if you take the residents out, and we're, because these are so new data and we're trying to learn how to do it, then at least in a statistical way, the relationship uh, deteriorates because the slope of the line was being driven collectively by the residents. And so within the migrants themselves, there's still a suggestion of an association between how far you have to go and how big your gonad is. But it's not as compelling as it is if you combine the birds together. So as I say, these data are new. We hope in time to have additional isotopic data, which we may be able to refine a little bit more about longitude as well as latitude. But this is the current state of affairs. So, OK, so concluding thus far then, in the longer diverged migrant and resident juncos from Virginia in a common garden, they differed in one index of migratory timing. They differed in several indices of reproductive timing. And the timing, depending on how you analyze the data, co-varies with the distance that they are from their uh, destinations. And to our minds at this point, we see these data as largely supporting Winker's prediction that in uh, a long diverged group, you might find uh, fixed genetic differences because these animals didn't converge in a common garden. Uh, and hence, that strikes us as support for Winker's hypothesis. Um, how about gene expression? Okay, so now I'm, I'm turning to Mark Peterson, former graduate student, and we wanted to know whether or not the migrants and the residents would uh, also be divergent, not just in system-wide dependent variables like hormone levels or uh, clinical protuberances, uh, but maybe also in target tissues uh, that might reveal differences between them and their gene expression. So we collected also with Eli Bridge, um, and um, Kim Roswell and Adam and, and Mark Peterson collected tissues at the end of the experiment, uh, put them in RNA later stuff, pectoral muscle, blood, liver, brain, and spleen. I've got stars by the pectoral muscle and the blood because we had enough money to analyze those two tissues in half the subjects. Uh, and I can show you about uh, the result in one of the tissues. So we extracted RNA from the migrant and the resident tissues, assayed for genes associated with reproductive timing and migratory behavior using RNA-seq, comparing residents to migrants. And what I have to show you at this point, because this is also uh, data in the process of being analyzed, is a heat map. So I suspect you've seen these things before, but what we've got here is each row is a gene, each column is an individual, the software clustering program combines the individuals that have the more similar patterns of gene expression across the, say, 300 or so genes that were differentially expressed. And it combines, uh, on the left, the residents, and on the right, the migrants. So I had to switch colors here. Apologize. And what we can see, because as I say, we didn't have the funds to analyze everybody, is that eight of nine um, residents clustered together at the left, and uh, nine of 10 um, uh, migrants clustered together on the right. So immediately, we want to know what, what, what are some of these genes that were differentially expressed between migrants and residents. There's not a lot of data like this out yet. There's data in the works 
for swings and thrushes, and there are data in the works for blackbirds in, uh, in Germany. And now there are these Junko data. And there's probably other data that I don't really know about because it's such a fast-moving field. But I know, don't know of any published studies showing differential gene expression in tissues for migrants and residents. So, so far, a couple of things that we can identify as differentially expressed, in a sense, make sense. Okay, so that the upregulated in residents were genes that have been associated with multicellular organismal reproductive processes or developmental processes involved in reproduction. And with respect to the migrants, genes that are associated with lipid transport and with fatty acid catabolic processes. So, as I said, these data are still being analyzed. They're really preliminary at this point. We have another heat map for blood. And again, the two groups uh, segregate, um, but we haven't made much progress on which genes. So Mark will proceed on looking for gene networks and uh, finding coordinated patterns of up and down uh, expression of genes, uh, hoping to relate ultimately uh, variation in gene expression to variation in the hormones that we saw or variation in the physiological measures that we saw. OK, am I talking loud enough? Good. <laughs> All right. So we wanted to contrast longer diverged populations to more recently diverged populations. So let me move on to those then. And that takes me to these juncos in South Carolina. <laughs> no. Southern California. <laughs> I don't know why I said South Carolina, but a south place, Southern California. And there it's the Oregon juncos. And Trevor Price and Pamela Ye working at UCSD were the first to identify and characterized the biology of juncos that began to breed in San Diego, particularly on the campus of the University of California, San Diego. Previously, there had been migrants there in the winter, but they departed. There were no breeders. And uh, there's a nice story to tell about a little girl who was the first one to say, hey, dad, there's a junco. And then dad says, no, no, it's July. And she says, dad, it's a junco. And that was confirmed by serious birders who had uh, really knew the San Diego situation, and there had not been breeding juncos in that region uh, prior to that time. Since then, uh, the population has it's stabilized and it appears to be expanding some, although it was really quite restricted for quite a while. The, po the environment is quite different if you're a breeder in the city of an Oregon junco, birds that are more common at that part of the world, only at higher elevations. So it's urban, it's milder. We think the ancestral population was migratory. The colonists have become sedentary. They've diverged in morphology. They differ in body size and how much white they have in the tail. They uh, diverged in parental behavior. And really critically, they've diverged in timing, OK? So that the city birds uh, begin reproducing earlier in the year, and they reproduce for longer, uh, maybe three, potentially four broods in the city as opposed to the nearby mountains where they breed. So early breeding, more broods. And we want to know, because we're trying to contrast recently diverged and more uh, distantly diverged populations, whether or not in this heteropatric situation, because there are migrants there in the winter, but they leave, uh, is the differences between them more plastic or more fixed. And that's just a picture of what the city looks like. So I could show you a lot of mountain pictures, um, but this aerial view of the San Diego campus is, is meant to convey that this is a really pretty different world that these birds had moved into. So we did similar things. Okay, we compared urban and resident, uh, uh, sorry, urban and montane, my resident and migrant chuncos, first in the wild and then in a common garden. This is done ac work that was actually done sooner. In the field, we measured initial T and T in response to GnRH, as we did in the captives in the earlier study that I told you about. And then we, once again, captured juveniles and brought them back to Indiana. So from the urban population and from the montane population, we caught birds in their first summer and brought them back to Indiana. And same food, same temperature, same day length, the natural day length that they would have experienced in California and held them in a, in a common garden. And then we sampled fat and initial T and T in response to GnRH during the breeding season. OK, what did the hormones look like in the field? On the left is the um, migrants in blue. And on the right is the residents in red. And what's plotted is every individual that got caught in blood. 
okay? And the lower line is what their initial testosterone levels were for all those individuals averaged in the two populations. And the higher line is what their testosterone in response to GnRH was. So the elevated testosterone levels are above. And what you can see is in the urban population, the testosterone rose early, didn't go up to quite as high a level, and then came back down again. Um, whereas in the mountain populations in the wild, the testosterone, well, first they had to show up. Then the testosterone was slower to rise in terms of calendar dates, actually had higher peak levels uh, during the breeding season, and then uh, came down again. So they do different things with respect to indices of timing in the wild. What do they do in a common garden? Well, this is the same slides for the field study, and then this is showing what you did in the common garden. So unlike what we saw in the longer diverged populations, what we're seeing here is convergence. So you can still tell blue from red, <laughs> but the initial levels of testosterone are uh, indistinguishable among the migrants and the residents, and the elevated levels of testosterone T in response to GnRH are uh, not distinguishable between the migrants and the residents. So we interpret this as convergence or greater plasticity in the more recently diverged populations that differ in their, in their timing. <coughs> Okay, so just to repeat conclusions so far, and then I'll see if I should stop for questions or show, tell you one more thing. The longer diverged migrant and residents, they differed in, and this is just review, I could test you, they differ in the indices of reproductive timing and in gene expression. For the more recently diverged, they are similar in their indices of reproductive timing, and we don't have any data yet on gene expression. So we see this as support of this notion of a difference in plasticity versus more fixed differences in heteropatric populations. Okay, um, I'm going to tell you the kinds of things we're doing next, but I'm not going to show you any more data, all right? One of the themes was, where does the variation lie? Okay, so we're seeing differences in the hormonal output, but was it in perception? Was it in transduction? Was it in uh, release or uh, responses at the various levels or tissues. So we want to know where the variation lies. Which components of the HPG axis differ between migrants and residents? Is the variation at the level of the hypothalamus, at the pituitary, at the gonad, all along the axis? This is the kind of variation that we'd like to try to partition and compare and contrast between migrants and residents, in part to know why they do different things, but also uh, more importantly in the current context, sort of what did selection act on to give rise to differential responses to the same environment. So back to John's figure, we'll be working up and down here to try to learn more about these things. Uh, this little set of slides I'm gonna pass through. And this is only hypothetical. So we look to see whether negative feedback might be suppressing uh, elevations of LH in response to, this is very hormony, so just hang in there with it for a second, um, might be affecting uh, the pituitary by, let me say it another way. It's a really nice day in the spring. Migrants and residents might think, wow, this is a really good time to breed. They both sort of ramp up in terms of their HPG axes. But if you're a migrant, you're not going anywhere. It might be advantageous if there were a stronger suppressive response to the part of the body that goes, ooh, nice weather, time to breed. The other part of the body saying, no, not time yet, not you, you're a migrant. But anyway, we looked at, uh, at negative feedback and did not find support for that idea. So where will we be looking next? Well, we'll be looking, sorry, I'm flipping here. Um, we'll be looking at the level of the gonad next. So we'll be using quantitative PCR to compare the relative abundance of receptors for signaling molecules on the gonad. The gonad was smaller, okay? The LH output, as I brushed on past there, was similar. So is the gonad more expressive of things that suppress its growth, or is it more expressive of things that enhance growth uh, if, you're a, if you're a resident? This is a study that's just underway. Okay, so in the future, we'll be asking how genetically different the migrants and the residents are whether these timing differences affect mating preferences as well. Do they like what they look like on the breeding grounds, or do they like birds that look like they're ready to breed regardless of their appearance? Um, how do songs and displays vary geographically? Which brings me back to Dustin Reichard, who studied geographic variation in song uh, in this species, and I think it's a time for us all to come together on this. Dustin, I'm looking forward to it. 
and then how do song and plumage signals interact with timing uh, to affect mating. So this was our Venn diagram. It's our desire to co-consider seasonality, evolutionary endocrinology, geographic variation, population divergence by a lot of concentration over a long period of time on a single species. And many people to thank. And I also want to thank John and Marilyn. So John and Marilyn welcomed me into their lab in 1985. I'd been a migration person at that time, but I wanted to learn about hormones. And uh, so they said I could come and learn. And we've been friends ever since. So thank you both very much. But OK, questions? Thank you.